You should have picked up if you had the opportunity to get one of these handouts. And I don't have one here to show me, but it's today we're beginning a brand new series that is probably one of the longest, if not the longest series that I've ever done. And it's called The Life in, in Times of Christ, uh, The Life in Ministry of Christ. Uh, and it will go to the last Sunday in May. And today is going to be um, an introduction. But if you pick up one of those little handouts, it will give you an outline of each month from now to the end of this series. So instead of giving you all, all, all of the, the series at one time, we felt like it would be easier for you to be able to keep up with it if we just gave you one month at a time. So if you didn't get one, feel free to pick one up on the way out, or you can pick one up next Sunday. And that way you will know how, to, how you can keep up with the scriptures that we're using and some things that we're talking about, give you a heads up on the sermon. John chapter 3, verse 36. The Bible said, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for speaking to us as only you can through our teacher, Holy Spirit. May the things that we say bring honor and praise and glory to you and exalt you in Jesus' name. Amen. No one has ever influenced this world or this world's history like Jesus Christ. It is obvious that he was the most unique person that ever walked the face of this earth. He is the subject of the best-selling book that has ever been on the market, and that is the Bible. His followers number into untold millions of millions of people. In the past 2,000 years plus, people have not only lived by his principles, many have died for their faith in him. Today, there are innumerable people who call themselves Christians. Both in America and around the world, there are countless millions who have put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But in spite of the miraculous growth of the church of the living Lord, there are still searching questions in the minds of thousands whom have never received him as their personal savior. And the unsaved world wants to know who is Jesus Christ? Is he really God? Could he actually do the things that he claimed that he did? Was he literally the embodiment of God in truth? Is he the only way to heaven? These are real questions, and these are searching questions. They are honest questions that deserve honest answers and straightforward answers. They are questions who have been on the minds, or that have been on the minds of people who have struggled for the past 2,000 years about this person called Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So with these thoughts in mind, we're going to spend the next six months looking at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the greatest story ever told. So as we begin our series on the life and ministry of Christ, I want you to look with me for just a few moments outside of the Bible as we study a symbol that we talked about years ago that I, that I gave you a handout concerning, and that is that a symbol that archaeologists tell us that was on so many of the graves of early Christians drawn on the walls of caves where these early Christians had, had, had to hide in order to worship for fear of being killed. And that is the symbol of a fish. So what we're going to do for the next little while is well, I'm going to give you an introduction and a history lesson. And then for the next few Sundays, we're, we're going to try to get back into a preaching mode. But today we're going to do just some study, all right? 
This word uh, that you see inside of fish is, uh, is an interesting word, and it is the word ichthos. Uh, many of you have seen, uh, have seen a fish, the symbol of a fish, on the back of cars, on the pendants that, that ladies wear, uh, on necklaces. And inside of that fish, sometimes you will see the word Christ, which is not literally what was supposed to be inside of that fish. Doesn't hurt anything, but it wasn't what it originally stood for. The fish becomes a symbol that the early Christians lived and died by. Jesus said in Matthew chapter four, verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now the Greek word inside of that little fish that you can't quite figure out what it says is the word ichthos. And it is spelled with five letters. And each of those five letters stands for something different, but for the same thing. The first letter in that word is the word I. And the word I is the first letter in the Greek word for Jesus. The next letter in that word is the letter X. X is the first letter in the Greek word for Christ. The next letter in the word ichthos is an O. And the O is the first letter in the Greek word for God. And the next letter in that fish is a V. And the V is the first letter in the Greek word for son. And the last word, a letter in the word ichthos is an S. And that is the first letter in the Greek word for Savior. Therefore, when an early Christian, for fear of his life, but wanting to share his faith with a stick or with his toe or, or with a paintbrush on a cave wall, he drew the picture of a fish in the sand, on a wall, or in some hidden place, and he was simply saying with these letters, Jesus is Christ, he is the Son of God, and he is my Savior. And that truth marks the real meaning of the life of Jesus Christ that we will be studying in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let me stop here and give you a little more insight. The letter X is the first letter in the Greek word that means Christ. Ever so often you will see the word for Christmas spelled X-M-A-S. It is the same standing for the word Christ. Must. Because of ignorance or because of tradition, there are some preachers every Christmas that have a crusade that says something like this, don't ex Christ out of Christmas. And little do they know that the X stands for Christ. So don't get indigestion when you see Christmas spelled Xmas, because it means Christmas. Hope that makes you feel better. So as we begin our study in the life and, and the times of Christ, we're going to look at, at um, the ongoing story in the Gospels. Obviously, we can't look at everything or it would take probably the rest of my life and the rest of your life. But we're going to look at some things that we need to understand. The first thing that you need to understand is this. The Gospels do not give us a text on the life of Christ. The Gospels do not provide us with a detailed account of his life. 
In other words, the Gospels are not biographies of our Lord. So let's look at the Gospels. Matthew did not sit down to write a biography of the life of Christ. Neither did Mark, neither did Luke, nor did John. And as a result, you would not expect to find in any of these Gospels all of the events of his life. In fact, John tells us in John chapter 21, verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So in all of the things that we know about Christ, in all of the scriptures that we're going to study about Christ, please understand that the gospels are not and a biography of the life of Christ. So what then do we have in the Gospels? We simply have four thematic accounts of the life of Christ. That is, what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what I call snapshots from the life of Christ. And each of these snapshots are from a different point of view and each of them developing a particular theme. For an example, Matthew looks at Christ from one point of view and develops one theme concerning his life. Mark looks at Christ from another point of view and develops another theme for his life, and so does Luke and so does John. Therefore, each of the writers select their material and arranges their material in such a manner as to develop the theme that they're trying to put over for people to see and to hear and to understand about Christ. Now, in order for us to better understand what I'm saying or trying to say, I want you to look with me as we study each theme of the gospel. The first gospel is the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew wrote his gospel to the Jews. That is evident from the reoccurring quotations from the Old Testament. And that was because he was writing to Jews who were familiar with Old Testament scriptures. Matthew, more than any other gospel writer, identifies events and utterances of the life of our Lord with Old Testament prophecies. So Matthew was writing to the Jews. The theme of Matthew's gospel is Jesus is the king. And that theme is brought forth in the following ways. First, Christ is often referred to as the son of David. In the Old Testament, David had been promised a son who would sit upon his throne forever. David's genealogy in Matthew is traced through Joseph to King David. And that is because in the Old Testament, the right to the throne came through the father and not through the mother. And it is only in Matthew when Jesus made his triumphant entry uh, into Jerusalem do we have these words. Behold, your king cometh. <coughs> these words are a quote from Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. And this is what Zechariah said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes to thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Therefore, <coughs> Matthew writes his gospel to show the Jews that Jesus Christ truly is Messiah by providing and proving to them that he is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies concerning the king and the kingdom of God. So look with me very quickly at the next gospel, which is the gospel of Mark. Now the gospel of Mark was written to the Romans. Although Mark was not an eyewitness, he was probably the interpreter of Peter who was an eyewitness. Now, the theme of Mark's gospel 
is that Christ is the servant of God. And so Mark brings forth that theme in the following ways. First, there is no genealogy given to us in Mark. The reason for that is that the genealogy of a servant is not important. Second, there are no discourses or speeches or sermons in Mark's gospel because the servant is always busy as seen in the words straightway and immediately. So Mark is writing to the Romans to show how Jesus is Messiah by providing and proving with them that he is the Old Testament fulfilled of prophecies concerning the servanthood of God. Next, we have the Gospel of Luke. And this gospel was written to the Greeks. Luke's gospel contains the best Greek in all of the gospels. The gospel theme of Luke is that Christ is the Son of Man. This theme is brought forth in these ways. First, the genealogy emphasis is on the perfect humanity of Christ and traces his ancestry to Mary. Luke's gospel gives us the details of the birth and infancy of the Lord through the standpoint of the virgin birth. Luke alone tells us of Christ's boyhood and reveals some of his prayer life more than any of the other gospels. Luke also takes time to show Christ's relationship to man's needs and pictures the death of Christ as the death for the sins of all men. Therefore, Luke writes his gospel to show the Greeks that Jesus Christ truly is Messiah by proving and providing that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the incarnation of the Son of God. The last gospel is that of John. And John's gospel was written to the whole world. John presents Jesus to the world as the Son of God. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through him. And so John writes his gospel to prove that he is the Son of God. And he, and he uses this theme. First of all, John alone records the great I am declarations of Christ that tie him with Jehovah of the Old Testament. Second, John presents Christ as the word of creation, who is the essence of the eternal Godhead. And then John, John's gospel is the story of seven miracles, all arranged in a way to show divine intervention in natural circumstances. Therefore, John writes his gospel to show the whole world that Jesus is the Messiah by, prov by providing and proving that he is God and therefore fulfills Old Testament prophecies concerning the same. So, do you see what happens then in these four gospels? The common denominator in all of these gospels is this. They are all written to prove that Jesus is Messiah. From each of them, they write a separate theme proving the same truth from a different point of view. Matthew says he is Messiah because he's the king. Mark says he is Messiah because he is the obedient servant of God. Luke says he is Messiah because he is the son of man. And John says he is Messiah because he's the son of of God. And that's who Christ is. He is the king. He is the obedient servant. He became a man. He is God incarnate. And that brings us back to the symbol of the fish that we started with. The earlier Christians were correct when they drew that fish with their toe or a stick or a paintbrush on a cave. Jesus is the Christ he is the Son of God. He is my Savior. And my question is, do you know 
this Christ, this Lord of glory. So during our studies of the life and ministry of Christ, we're going to be going through these four gospels and we're going to glean our information from the hand of these writers who spoke and were wrote by the leading and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will soon realize in this study that the materials included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are almost parallel one another. Therefore, these first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels. Now the word synoptic comes from two Greek words which means soon and opsis. The word synoptic means seeing together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing things that are parallel to each other from a different point of view. So they're called synoptic gospels. John deals in an entirely different manner. He deals, as we said earlier, in seven miracles. And the discourses that go with each of them, therefore, John's gospel stands alone as he writes to a world to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In our studies of the life of Christ, we will look at the gospels and in so doing, you'll notice that there will be times that these gospels seem to contradict themselves. For an example, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew is long and the Lord's Prayer in Luke is short. Secondly, in Mark we are told that there is one blind man healed and in Matthew we're told that there were two. Now there seems to be a real problem with some people in this area when it comes to reading scriptures, especially if they're trying to justify their unbelief in the Word of God. <clears throat> now in order for us to understand and find an answer, we have to go to the Word of God for our information. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is what the Scripture says. For as much as many have taken in hand to set in order the declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, and even as they delivered them unto us, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. In this passage of scripture, Luke is telling us that he got his information and he put it together and created a gospel. How did he get it? First of all, he says, from other narratives. As the King James Version says, from other declarations. This word is a very technical word, and it means a concise historical statement. And that is Luke's very first source. Secondly, he said, from those who were eyewitnesses to the events of the life of Christ. And then he says in number three, from the ministers of the word. Who were those ministers of the word? They were the apostles. Now this is made a little more clear in the American Standard Version. For as much as many have taken in hand to draw up a narrative concerning those matters which have been fulfilled among us, even as they delivered them unto us, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So look with me at these three sources. The first is the word narratives. Now you'll notice these words. For as much as many have taken in hand to draw up a narrative concerning these matters. In other words, now watch this. By the time Luke sets down to write, there is a host of concise reports already circulating throughout the countryside concerning the events of the life of Christ. These reports or written documents happen something like this. The apostles would go from church to church or from town to town and would stand up and say, 
I would like to tell you about what happened in the life of Jesus as he fed the 5,000. Now, it was the custom for the elders to record the events of importance in the early church. Therefore, as one of these apostles would stand up to proclaim uh, what he knew or to share what he was an eyewitness of, the elders would pick up their pen and they would begin writing on a scroll of papyri. Then another day, one of the apostles would visit one of the churches and say, I would like to tell you what happened beside the pool of Bethesda." Then immediately the elders would reach for their pen and they would reach for their scroll and they would begin to write. So this is how the documents came into existence. Now look with me also at the eyewitness reports and how they might have differed. It is imperative that we understand that Jesus went about the countryside from town to town that he preached the same message in different areas. For an example, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 5 was given in this place with much more emphasis than the Lord's Prayer is given in Luke's Gospel. That's what preachers do all the time. For an example, when I am away in revival efforts, I preach the same sermons I preach here. Years ago, when I was preaching three sermons a day, uh, three sermons a morning on Sunday morning, I would preach the very same sermon. What's so amazing is someone would, would come at the early service at, at 8.30 and I would preach. And I would preach the same sermon at, at, at 9.15 or 9.30, whenever it was, I don't remember now. And I would preach the same sermon. And then when I had to preach at 11, I would preach the very same sermon. I, will, I shall never forget that one day, Harold Early came to the early service or the second service, and uh, he had, his family was coming over for, for uh, some event, and so he stayed for the 11 o'clock service. And he told me after the, after the service was over, then I, I would go to the front door because I, I was able to get there, and he said, you know what, preacher? He said, I always believe that you preach the same sermon all three services. I said, I do preach the same sermon in all three services. He said, the same sermon that I heard at 11, other than the text and just a few things, sounded nothing like the sermon that I heard at, at 10.15 or 10 o'clock, whenever it was. Why is that? Now listen to me carefully. God uses preachers to preach to the needs of the people that are sitting in the sound of his voice. You understand what I'm saying? Now listen to me carefully. God the Holy Ghost knew who was going to be at an early service when I preached at, at the early service at eight something. God the Holy Ghost knew who was going to be at the second service when I preached the second service. And God the Holy Ghost knew who was going to be at 11 when I preached at 11. So what happened in that time, as I began to preach and the Holy Spirit began to give me unction, that I would unbeknowings of what was actually happening other than the fact that I was being led in a different direction to preach the same sermon, but with a different emphasis to a different congregation. For an example, someone might have heard me preach in, in one service uh, uh, about angels. And, and you might answer, well, sure, I, I remember hearing that sermon on angels. And then you would say, well, did you remember when he said this or that about angels? And you may say, well, I, he didn't say anything about that in the sermon I, I was listening to. So what has happened? A different people brought about a different need by the same message. Now, the third thing is the ministers of the word. Now, we need to realize that each of the gospel writers had different purposes in their writing, as we've already seen. 
Once more, look at this example from the scriptures. All of the gospel records contain certain miracles that our Lord performed. But not all of the records are the same miracles. You understand what I'm saying? Matthew might record one miracle. Mark might record another miracle. Luke might record another miracle. And John might record another miracle. But none of the Gospels record all of the miracles. But every miracle that is recorded in the Scriptures or recorded to show and to prove the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. And so what are our conclusions concerning the Scriptures? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So let me close this morning, this introduction, by making this statement. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. But simply the Word of God was designed to meet the needs of all men everywhere with the message of salvation. In the coming months, we're going to look in detail at the life and ministry of Christ. We're going to see some things from each of the Gospels. Those of you that are with me downstairs in the Gospel of John, we hear some things again. But we will look at the life and ministry of Christ in a way that will make it personal and will make it applicable to my life and to yours. I said earlier, I preached a lot of series, not one any more important than the one that you have just heard the introduction to today. I realize that we're beginning a series of tremendous importance at the very beginning of winter. So our question is, why would you begin a, a series of this great importance at the beginning of winter? My answer is simple. That's what God put on my heart. We may have some bad weather and we may not. But I promise you this, that in the Sundays ahead, I encourage you to make every effort, not for you just to be here, but to bring someone with you who needs to hear and know and understand who this Christ is whom we serve. You may have some lost friends and families that need to hear these messages. Make sure that you invite them to come. This series will be simple and the messages will be sometimes somewhat short. Maybe not. But I want you to know that in the next few weeks and months, I, I, have, I have allowed God the freedom to pour everything that I can hold in my heart and head to pour out to you concerning the Lord of glory. Why would I do that? Because this. Of all the stuff that's going on in the world around us, nothing is more important than the subject and the person of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. <clears throat> If you have never invited Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, I encourage you to do that today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, lift your hand. Say it with me. Father, your word is true. Give me the desire and the understanding to see your life and your love as we study your word together. Help me to understand that through the finished work of Christ, I really am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever God's put on your heart, I want you to step down from where you are, make your way to the front, and you come right now as God speaks to you.